uh, have a research level popular technical talks by eminent mycologists of India abroad and abroad throughout the year. Professor B.S. Sharma, who passed away on September 26, 2012, devoted most of the formative years of his life serving not only the students of Allahabad University, but also the students and research scholars of the whole country by organizing a series of conferences on anthropology spread throughout the country. These conferences were very popular under his leadership and many mathematicians of the country extended their full cooperation to serve the cause of promoting mathematics. Professor Sharma himself was trained in the French School of Mathematics and uh, as all of you know, he worked for his PhD under the great mathematician Professor Henry Garta. His ambition was to create an atmosphere at Allahabad, something like what he saw and experienced in Paris. Among the mathematicians who created this trust, a mention should be made of Professor Ranjilal, myself, Professor S.S. Kare, Himadri Mukherjee, Ashish Upadhyay, R.P. Shukla, Piyush Kare, Swapnil Srivastav, Lakshmi Kant Mishra, and numerous PhD students of these teachers. A whole generation of mathematics teachers in Allahabad is indebted to Professor B.L. Sharma, not only for his teaching of mathematics, but also being a role model as a great human being. And this small effort is a tribute to a fighter who dedicated his whole life for the youth, for the society, and for the country. This trust has been registered under the Society's Registration Act, and a team of office bearers has been appointed to implement the objectives of this trust. I am extremely happy that the first program among the popular mathematics lecturers under this auspices of this trust is being given by the most famous mathematician of international stature, Professor M. S. Raghunathan, FRS, who knew B.L. Sharma very well. In fact, Professor B.L. Sharma had very high regards for Professor Raghunathan and his mathematics. And uh, Professor Raghunathan will be formally introduced by Professor Ravi Kulkarni, former director of HRI, who also knew Professor B.L. Sharma and had a role to play in uh, the development of HRI at Allahabad. I wish to make only one remark about Professor Raghunathan that all mathematicians coming from Allahabad, influenced by Professor Bhil Sharma, are great fans and admirers of Professor Raghunathan and his leadership in molding Indian mathematics. And I am very happy that he is going to give two talks. And the first talk, as you know, is going to be Science and the Quest for Beauty, which will be today. And on 4th March, the second lecture will be given by Professor Raghunathan. I am really uh, highly grateful to him. And on behalf of the trust, I thank him for accepting our invitation to give these two talks. So with these few words, I would like to now hand over to Ashish Upadhyaya for the further proceedings. Ashish. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, there is a small uh, modification for uh, uh, in your address. Uh, today, the... Um, uh, formal introduction of uh, speaker, Professor M. S. Raghunathan, uh, will be given by Professor Ramji Lal. And uh, Professor Kulkarni has very kindly agreed that he will uh, deliver a few lectures later on. Uh, now, with this uh, note, I will like to mention that the Trust is very fortunate to have Professor Ramji Lal as one of its founding trustees, uh, who was also uh, head of the Department of Mathematics in University of Allahabad and uh, had been uh, uh, had served the department as a professor for long. Uh, although a mathematical gathering uh, of uh, this type, which we have today here, online needs no introduction uh, to today's speaker, Professor Raghunathan. However, following established traditions, uh, I will request 
Professor Ramji Lal to formally introduce Professor Raghunathan. Professor Ramji Lal, sir. Thank you, Ashish, uh, for all your words. Uh, at the very outset, let me first uh, <coughs> welcome and greet you all on the occasion of National Science Day. Friends, it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce one of the finest mathematicians, Professor Ramesh Raghunathan, who has kindly agreed to initiate and inaugurate the academic activities uh, in the Professor B.L. Sharma Higher Mathematics Trust by giving two talks. Raghunathan started his career, research career at TFR in 1960 after his BS, BA honors and worked under the guidance of Professor M. S. Narsimhan, uh, another legend in mathematics. Indeed, young Raghunathan in his 20s had already become a role model for young researchers at TFR. Professor M. S. Raghunathan has contributed, contributed very significantly to the central and guiding problems in mathematics. His main contribution is in the discrete subgroups of D groups, D groups, the arithmeticity and the rigidity problems. The solution to the congruence subgroup problem is another important contribution to his credit. Indeed, contribution of Raghunathan are immense and are all outcomes of a sharp and great mind coupled with extraordinary scholarship. Uh, as recognition to his uh, fundamental contributions, he had been award honored by several awards, including FRS and Padmushan. I may further mention that he has immense contribution to the growth of mathematics in India in different capacities. He, has he, he was instrumental in holding the only ICM in India in 2010. The, the event inspired many young researchers in mathematics throughout the country. The title of the today's talk, as already mentioned by Professor Satyadev, Science and Quest for Beauty. Uh, you will see the perception of beauty in science and mathematics by a mathematician like Raghunathan. You may have the feel that beauty, truth, science, and mathematics are one and the same. The second talk, of course, uh, will be on March 4, 2021, uh, will be on what is mathematics. As you all know, the most coveted book uh, entitled What is Mathematics by Pura and Robbins describes the, their perception of mathematics, and which appeared in 1941, the birth year of Raghunathan, as if they left the perception of afterward developments in mathematics to be described by Raghunathan. Professor R. M.S. Raghunathan, uh, may describe some of the most uh, substantial developments in mathematics during the 20th century. I invite Professor R M. S. Raghunathan to deliver the talk, and I'm sure you will appreciate the beauty in science, beauty in science and mathematics. Thank you, Professor Raghunathan. Yeah. Ashish, thank yeah. you. So, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. May I now request uh, Professor M. S. Raghunathan to kindly deliver his uh, lecture today. I don't know. I don't see how I can make a presentation because, uh, how do I? I mean, you know, I don't see the... Ashish, I, how do I make a presentation? How do I make the screen? How do I make my uh, file come on the screen? Yeah, share the content. We have to, you have to... Uh, put the button, share the content. There must be a button for that. Yeah, there's, I don't see that button. That's what I'm saying. Oh, uh, sir, once, uh, once you click share screen. Okay. Share screen, I put in. Yes. Ah, okay. Good. Now wait for some time. Yes. Yeah. Yes, now you can, yes, sir. can everybody see the screen, please? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. sir. Yeah. It is visible. Okay. <clears throat> Let me first of all. <laughs> Thank uh, Professor Ramjilal for the kind words of introduction. I'm really happy that I've been asked to give this talk under the auspices of the BL Sarma Trust. As uh, we're already told, Professor Sarma was a very good friend of mine. <clears throat> we have had a long association. Uh, I, I'm not myself a topologist, but I do have some knowledge of topology. And we have had uh, conversations about topology several times. <clears throat> anyway, uh, Professor Sarma, apart from being a good mathematician, was also an activist who involved himself in many political issues, serious political issues. And 
came out successful in some of them. <clears throat> I'm indeed happy that I've been asked to give this talk. I feel honored and I'm happy. <clears throat> Let me begin, uh, you know, on science day, mostly people in other disciplines talk on this day. Uh, this, I'm, I, my, I'm afraid my audience is largely mathematicians. So I had hoped that there'll be some, some people outside <laughs> mathematics will be there, especially lay people, but it doesn't seem to be the case. In any event, in any event <clears throat> uh, at the risk of uh, telling you things which you already know very well, I'll, I will go ahead and give you my talk. <clears throat> now, you know, it's readily acknowledged that all art, and I include uh, literature in that, is a search for the beautiful, <clears throat> an aesthetic quest. That the aesthetic drive is an important component in the pursuit of science, <clears throat> in which term I include technology as well, is much less appreciated. <clears throat> in fact, one of the great English poets seems to think that science is the very antithesis of uh, the search for beauty. What's happening here? Ah, there is a... <clears throat> There is a quotation, here is a quotation from a long poem by, called Lamia by John Keats. Look at what he has to say. Do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy. There was an awful rainbow once in heaven. We know her woof, her texture. She is given the dull catalog of common things. Philosophy will clip an angel's wings, conquer all the mysteries by rule and line, empty the haunted air and gnomed mine and unweave a rainbow. So there it is. <clears throat> philosophy, of course, means natural philosophy, or which is the word for which is the expression for science. In the world days in Keats' days, <clears throat> science was called natural philosophy, and he says philosophy will clip an angel's wings. So that's what he thinks. Philosophy cannot uh, really. <clears throat> angel, of course, is uh, one of the symbols of beauty, and will clip the angel's wings and destroy it. <clears throat> more or less, to destroy beauty, more or less. That's what he seems to say. And we were rainbow, he says, and that's a, obviously an attack on Newton who explained how rainbows happen. So for him, Newton was a <clears throat> Philistine, <clears throat> a vandal who destroyed the beautiful rainbow. That's, uh, that is the view of uh, John Keats. And so he doesn't think that science has anything to do with beauty. In fact, it's the very antithesis of beauty is what Keats thinks. <clears throat> So, however, let's, what, let's see what Newton himself, one of the greatest scientists of all time, has to say about his work, about science. I do not know, I'm, here is the quote from Newton, I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself, I seem to have been only a, like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then, finding a smooth pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, while the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Note the words, smooth, pebular, pretty, prettier shell. Clearly, he was looking for beautiful things, <clears throat> like, a, like a little boy playing on the seashore. That's what he says. So he certainly thought of uh, what he was doing as a quest for beauty, without question, though uh, kids think quite otherwise. <clears throat> well. I must say, however, there's a little aside, really. You know, the first line says, I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself, I seem to have been a boy, etc., etc. All that makes uh, Newton sound very modest. But I, I don't think he was really modest. He certainly knew very well that he was considered one of the greatest minds in all of Europe, with whom uh, people admired him all over Europe. That bit of... Uh, <coughs> Said that, bit, that statement, uh, well, it's a, it's a bit disingenuous. It's not quite honest. But the rest of it, of course, is okay. I mean, he was uh, humble in the, in, the, in the sense that when he looked at science, he felt himself small. <clears throat> it's not as if uh, he was uh, humble in the conventional sense where 
which every politician is who keeps saying i didn't do anything i i know i i am no good that that's not the kind of uh, humility that newton possessed in any case he didn't have to be modest i mean the modesty in, in people like uh, <coughs> newton is not called for it's uh, well it's in general a somewhat overrated virtue and certainly in the case of uh, great scientists like newton that applies in any case <clears throat> well there is if there's one difference between science and art you could say it is this art demands often a willing suspension of disbelief you, you have to believe what 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 the what the artist says even if it's uh, it, does, it doesn't seem to be right <clears throat> that's what uh, art demands it demands a willing suspension of disbelief whereas science <clears throat> begins with a deliberate suspension of all belief it doesn't want to say take anything for granted it does of course sometimes take something for granted but specifies what it takes for granted and goes on <clears throat> on the basis of that always willing to throw away any belief which was held the moment is found to be not correct <clears throat> not true well so that was uh, not all poets however thought like uh, keats here is what another poet alexander pope had to say god said let newton be and all was light you can't pay a finer tribute to newton than that <laughs> this is of course a take off on uh, the biblical statement god said let there be light and there was light that was the old biblical statement and here is a take off on that which is uh, a splendid tribute to newton <clears throat> well what is beauty beauty is very difficult to define but here is a here is a, the first line from the from a long poem again by keats endim the the name of the poem is endymion it starts with the line a thing of beauty is a joy forever and maybe that can be taken as a definition of beauty joy forever is what beauty is that's that's the description that's that's probably a good uh, different definition of beauty as good as it can get in general of course it's very difficult to define beauty <clears throat> if that is the definition of beauty joy forever that's something which i think most mathematicians will agree with that definition but it is not that won't be inspired by the mythological story of endymion the product of greek genius but another product of greek genius namely you played everybody knows had this great book called the elements <clears throat> which was uh, the beginning of uh, presenting mathematics in a very formal fashion <clears throat> and in that that book has been a source of joy for generations of mathematicians i'm sure even to today school kids when they are first exposed to euclid find it very exciting and therefore beautiful if you like <clears throat> so if that is not joy forever i won't know of any other thing which is a joy forever and that of course is a product of greek genius of euclid <clears throat> and so with that in mind certainly the mathematicians will agree that a thing of beauty is a joy forever <clears throat> that would be a good definition of beauty for the <clears throat> that would be a good definition of beauty for the mathematician as well i think it's a Thing of beauty is a joy forever. <clears throat> Now let me take out a little time to see to illustrate how mathematics can be beautiful with a simple example from Euclid. <clears throat> well, this is something which all mathematicians know. So my apologies if I am repeating it to the, to the mathematicians. Well, it's a piece of mathematics which uh, practically everyone considers utterly beautiful. And what is more very interesting is that. it has required very little background in mathematics if you know your arith school arithmetic you can understand the theorem and its proof i'm going to state the theorem now and its proof and this is the only bit of uh, technical thing i will go into in this entire lecture since i am a mathematician my partiality is to mathematics and therefore this is i i give the only example of uh, of an actual piece of math, piece of science which is beautiful that will be in mathematics 
let me have to recall some basic definitions for those who may not be remember them from their school days. <clears throat> recall that a prime number or simply a prime is a whole number greater than one whose only divisors are itself and one. That's the only other numbers which divide it are itself and one, <clears throat> divided without a reminder. The first few primes, it is said there, two, three, five, seven, eleven, and so on. These are the first few primes. Euclid posed himself the following question. Is the collection of all primes a finite collection? <clears throat> so, does it, when the primes two, three, five, seven, eleven, does it come to a stop somewhere or does it go on, go on and on? That's a question which uh, Euclid raised, asked himself, and he answered it in the negative. He proved the following theorem. <clears throat> the set of all prime numbers is an infinite set. And I'm going to give a proof of this because the proof is beautiful <clears throat> and it's easy. This theorem with its proof is regarded by most, if not all mathematicians, as a lovely piece of mathematics. Instantly, the words like lovely, elegant, beautiful are quite often used by scientists, in particular math mathematicians. Maybe mathematicians use it even more often than other scientists do. It's a supreme illustration of the beauty of mathematics, the theorem as well as his proof. And here is what Euclid's proof is like. Euclid's proof is, suppose now that the collection of primes is finite. They can be listed, P1, P2, etc., Pn, P capital N, but capital N being a whole number. That's now the number capital M, which is the product of all the primes which you have listed, P1, P2, etc., Pn, then add one to it, that number I call M. And let D be the smallest of the divisors of M, different from one. Suppose M is not a prime. If M is a prime, you are done because you have found one more prime beyond P1, P2, Pn, and that would contradict our assumption that there are only finitely many primes. So <clears throat> suppose M is not a prime, and then D be the smallest of the divisors of M, which is different from one. Then D is a prime. Because if d prime not equal to one divides d, then d prime divides m. But in the, <coughs> d prime divides m, and <coughs> on the other hand, d prime is less than to d as it's the divisor of d. <coughs> it follows that d equals d prime. And because I have chosen it to be the smallest of the devices, it follows that d has to be equal to d prime. We conclude that d is a prime, and hence. So that means D has no devices other than one and itself, and so D is a prime, and therefore it must be one of the PIs here, because we listed all the primes. But then you divide them by any PI, the remainder is one. So PI doesn't divide them. So you find that you get a contradiction. That shows That thought the collection of primes must be infinite because our assumption that it is in finite arrived led us to a contradiction. Well, now that's a, that's a proof, and uh, anyone who finds it beautiful will find that the statistic sensibilities are the right resonance in the mathematical mind. <clears throat> now, let me move on to talk about sciences in general. The first uh, thing I want to talk about is. Let's, uh, you know, every, most, most people, it's, a, it's, it's a popular idea that uh, the original Ptolemy, Ptolemy's uh, representation of the planetary system with the Earth as center is wrong. Ptolemy had this idea that Earth was the center of everything, which is, of course, uh, what uh, Christianity preached, the center, Earth was the center and everything went around the Earth, all the planets, all the... <clears throat> The sun and the moon, they all went around the planets. And in the Ptolemaic system, the idea was that the center was the Earth, and everything, every other celestial object went around the Earth. This, everybody thinks, has been proved wrong by Copernicus. It's popular imagination to think, it's popularly believed that Copernicus proved uh, Ptolemaic wrong. That's not quite correct. There's nothing wrong with uh, Ptolemaic's idea of this Earth being the center, because all motion, the scientist knows, are relative. So you could adjust as well with the Earth the center, 
and try to understand the planetary system. The point of the Copernican system is that it is more elegant, it is more beautiful, it makes explanations much simpler. All planetary motion can be described and explained much better with, if you think of the sun as a center. So it's more an aesthetic uh, <coughs> reason than the reason of truth that shows that the Copernican system is the better system to understand the planetary system. It's not, the <clears throat> Ptolemy system is not wrong, but it's clumsy. It, 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 makes, it makes it very difficult to comprehend the motion of planets. Whereas if you look at the, look at this mess that is the pictorial representation here, it's not of course accurate, but the pictorial representation here is, is a total mess. There are all these planets going around and then the, I mean, all those uh, planets going around the sun <clears throat> and the sun itself is going around. So the planets are circling the planets, what they call epicircles and so on. So it's a big mess and it's very difficult to understand what's going on. Whereas the Copernican system makes things much pleasanter. So we, this is a familiar uh, <coughs> picture you have and you can see how everything is described. Of course, if you want to describe the motion of the moon around the planets, it becomes much more complicated. But if you try to do the Copernican system in the Ptolemaic system, it becomes almost impossible to understand what's going on. So the real, real reason is that the mathematics of the planetary movement becomes a lot more easy to understand, easy to describe if you follow the Copernican model, <coughs> Copernicus model. So there already, you can see the motivation for the scientists preferring the Copernican system over the <coughs> Ptolemaic system is simply the fact it's more elegant, it's more, it's more understandable, therefore beautiful if you like. <coughs> now, <coughs> let me want to, <coughs> In talking about Copernic system, let me show you what uh, Kepler had to say when he discovered that uh, all planets move in elliptic orbits. And he also saw, saw from his observations that they sweep out equal areas of, uh, <coughs> in equal amounts of time, they sweep out equal areas. That's how the planetary motion behaves. And when he discovered that, he had this to say. Uh, I attested it as true in my deepest soul and contemplated its beauty with incredible and ravishing delight. Look at the words, contemplated its beauty. So there, what, uh, John, what Johann Kepler was seeing in his discoveries was great beauty, <clears throat> which attests to my statement that uh, science is very much a quest for beauty. Okay, now I talked about, <clears throat> I know I talked about uh, beauty being joy forever. Another work which has produced great uh, joy for generations of scientists, in particular mathematicians, is this great book of Newton, Principia Mathematica. <clears throat> this book has been studied in the last 400 years about 400 years by scientists. And now the much of its content has now reached even school, high school children. <clears throat> and uh, this has produced great, uh, has, has given great pleasure to gen generations in the last 400 years and certainly qualifies as a thing of beauty. And certainly Newton's theory of uh, gravitation has great beauty in it. <clears throat> well, but of course the beauty here in this case has been, uh, <clears throat> well, the beauty has been apprehended through mathematics as, 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 as lots of uh, other things in physics have been. In fact, very often the beauty in physics comes through the language it uses, namely the language of mathematics. Now, as I said, 
beauty, beauty as a joy forever can also be illustrated by concrete examples which the artists will also admit as beautiful. Here is the one of the greatest examples of uh, beauty, if you like, in architecture, the Taj. No one, no one denies that it's a, it's a beautiful piece of uh, work. And the pressure you get at watching it, I don't think is uh, all that different from the pressure that the mathematician gets from Newton's Principia. <clears throat> and that's, Newton's Principia is also beautiful. Well, here, let me also point out that behind the beauty of the Taj is the work of the architect, who is really a, a scientist. And so in his conception, he has seen the beauty that, it, that the building would have if it's built according to his design. <clears throat> so in the design, there is beauty. And that was something which is, uh, which, which is beauty in science, if you like. <clears throat> now, here is another interesting story, which illustrates the beauty of science. The discovery of Neptune. <clears throat> A great scientific theory, apart from its uh, immediate appeal in terms of uh, how it explains many things, <clears throat> has another quality, which is, uh, which is that it predicts phenomena or experimental observations, which are not uh, available when the, when the discovery, when the, when the theory itself is formulated. <clears throat> and this is, a, here is an instance of such a thing, when a prediction came true, prediction on the, based on a scientific theory came true. This was the discovery of uh, Neptune, and it's a very nice story, a beautiful story if you like. <clears throat> this is a very fascinating story. In 1821, Alexis Boulevard published anatomical tables based on observations of the planet Uranus. You see some of the uh, characters involved in the story. There is, uh, <coughs> but I don't think I'll put Alexis Boulevard here. No. Anyway, Alexis Boulevard published astronomical tables based on observations of the planet Uranus and made predictions of future positions of the planet based on Newton's loss. Later observations, however, deviated considerably from these predictions. Worldwide had made some predictions, and these observations, uh, actual observations later, found that uh, the planetary positions were very different from, were somewhat different from what Worldwide has uh, <clears throat> had predicted. Now, Urban Jean Le Verrier, Let me, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This scientist, uh, Arbar Leverrier, this, this is the gentleman, a French scientist, mathematician. Uh, <clears throat> I tried to understand the de this deviation, and uh, he postulated the existence of a planet which had not been till then discovered. Existence of a planet based on Newton's laws. He found that if you if you put a planet in orbit uh, at a certain location in the solar system, then <clears throat> and assume certain things about that planet, about its way it uh, moved and things of that kind, then you can actually account for this uh, discrepancy. If, uh, with that extra planet, use the Newton's loss, you find the positions that uh, Neptune would take would be really different. <clears throat> Sorry, it's not the, I got it, uh, you're in. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. I mean, here, sorry, Alexis Boulevard had made uh, observations about the planet Uranus and then made 
uh, and found and, and later they were found to be there's a found to be discrepancies when the actual observations were made <coughs> based on those predictions but uh, leverrier tried to explain this uh, discrepancies and then he has uh, assuming the existence of a certain extra planet which was till then not known found that the discrepancies could be explained completely using newton's laws of motion and uh, he brought this to the attention of a uh, you know astro astronomer of <coughs> who, who was in an observatory namely gottfried galle jo johann gottfried galle who at the very promptly looked at, looked at the sky and obse made observations and discovered that uh, leverrier is absolutely right he located a planet exactly at the spot where leverrier had predicted it would be and so that planet is was later named neptune this is the discovery of neptune and this was facilitated by by newton's laws which were a scientific theory which had explained everything known till then and when a new thing came up which could not be which found, which was found that the discrepancy what it led to was that you had not we had not seen a, another planet which did exist and that was discovered you can see how science had contributed to a new discovery and this is certainly a very beautiful story <coughs> in astronomy in an episode of astronomy which is good and then there was more recently in the sir sorry uh, more recently uh, in the in the second decade of the 20th century another such prediction came true <clears throat> this was uh, the verification of uh, einstein's theory of relativity what happened here was this einstein's general theory predicted that light rays passing near a very dense object in the universe will have to bend they don't they don't they no longer move straight they are not they don't no move on straight lines they, they will get bent is what einstein's theory of relativity is predicted and nature afforded an opportunity to check this out <clears throat> a solar eclipse on may 29 1919 which was total in the west african island of principe afforded an opportunity to verify the prediction a team of scientists headed by the british astronomer arthur eddington looked for and found light emanating from stars directly behind the sun <coughs> reaching them so there was here is the sun at the time of the solar eclipse the photograph of the solar eclipse and there are rays of light coming from a star which was directly in the line behind line of the earth and the sun behind it and what uh, eddington and his team observed was that light from such a star reached their telescopes and could be seen <clears throat> and that could obviously happen only if the light ray bent because the star was behind the sun and uh, all rays emanating from it will block the sun except those i mean except those which uh, reach the periphery of the sun line joining the star and the periphery of the sun those lines would have gone straight on and not reach the earth unless they were bent so the bending of uh, light was <coughs> discovered was, was uh, found to be true which was predicted by relativity so another prediction which happened that <coughs> which which could be verified because of a theory built by einstein <coughs> now these are examples from physics and mainly astronomy but let me move to some examples from an example from biology <clears throat> well the myriad life forms that inhabit the earth has intrigued mankind from the from time immemorial the rigveda speculates on how universe is created but essentially throws up its hands saying who knows the bible tells us that god created all the diverse forms of life in just one week man being one of them a special one though 
but the rest were created for man's use and comfort. That seems to have satisfied the curiosity of much of the Western world for almost two millennia. There were, of course, skeptics, but the great artist Michelangelo was perhaps not one, or maybe he was one, but was nevertheless inspired by the story of creation in, in the Bible and created this great painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. This is Michael Angelo's painting depicting the creation of Adam according to the Bible. So here is God and he is bringing to life Adam. <clears throat> that was a painting. It's uh, one of the paintings greatly admired from, by everyone all over the world. It was inspired by the story of creation. But the creation story itself, of course, was, uh, has been thrown out by the scientists and <laughs> has been replaced by the scientists by another theory, the Darwin's theory of uh, evolution. It says the human being evolved from lower inverted, inverted commas, forms of life through millions of years, starting with the unicellular organisms which have life and then developing to the man. And this has been described, this entire evolution has been described as the greatest show on earth by Dawkins, one of uh, very well-known popular writers of science. <clears throat> now, Darwin's theory of evolution in one fell swoop explains ever so many things about life on Earth. A small Darwin made a small number of uh, assumptions, laws if you like, he called them laws if you like, and on the basis of this laws, he could explain how life of, of so many diverse kinds could evolve on Earth over a long period of time, for millions of years. And there's one interesting story which uh, how Darwin's uh, theories could uh, <clears throat> lead to a new discovery. What happened was this. <clears throat> Based on his theory, Darwin made many conjectures, which most many of them turned out to be, could, could later be verified as uh, true. But one simple conjecture <coughs> is what I want to talk about. It's a striking prediction he made that turned out to be right. It did not happen during his lifetime. It happened some a few decades after his death. <coughs> what uh, Darwin predicted was the following. There was a, there's a species of orchard found, or orchid, there's a species of orchid flower found in uh, Madagascar. which has an astonishingly long spur. <clears throat> and uh, Darwin said, if there's, a, if there's a flower with such a long spur, there must be insects which have a long tongue to draw, that, uh, draw the honey from such a flower. And nobody had seen, I mean, the, 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 <clears throat> the spur was something like a foot long and uh, Till at that time, no insect was known, either anywhere, in particular in Madagascar, which had such a long tongue that it could suck honey from the flower. <clears throat> and based on the fact, based on his ideas of survival of the fittest and how and things of the kind of that kind, Darwin predicted that there must be such an insect with a long tongue. And sure enough, some decades after his uh, death, they discovered. <clears throat> the giant hawk moth, scientists in Madagascar, uh, scientists exploring in Madagascar discovered the giant hawk moth, which has such a long tongue. <clears throat> Again, this is, uh, they looked for such an insect and found one. <clears throat> now, let me move to chemistry. Once again, like life forms, substances you find on Earth, various. Uh, <clears throat> the, 
there are a very large number of different kinds of uh, substances you find on earth and the and the way they seem to interact with each other is also infinitely many so it seems <clears throat> and uh, this of course people are trying to understand how what 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 are the various substances on earth and how they can be how they behave and how they can be used found this uh, very confusing and totally understandable when along came mendeleev who suggested a method by which he could uh, completely understand what was happening he discovered that there is a certain periodicity in the chemical behavior of the elements in his time we we did not know all the elements we know now he probably knew about uh, six odd elements i'm not sure how many but there are quite a few which are which people are not people did not know at that time and how were he uh, experimenting with the elements he knew <coughs> he formulated a principle he 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 suggested that all elements could be put in a table and they could they will display a periodicity of 7 the period depending on the atomic weight of the element <clears throat> so this he whatever elements that were known he put them down in a table and he found, he found that uh, there was a periodicity of 7 in the way they behaved <clears throat> so a periodicity of 7 in the atomic weights in the way they behaved and uh, it seemed to explain whatever people knew till that time about the behavior of chemical elements and certainly introduce a certain amount of order the chaos that was that is uh, chemical behavior of elements <clears throat> and certainly look finding some kind of order in chaos is is it's a successful uh, quest for beauty in a mess in something which is certainly not beautiful <clears throat> and uh, there and of course if if this uh, periodic table meant anything it should be able to give it, it it predicted that there were new elements because there were gaps in the the six elements could be fitted in this uh, periodic uh, periodic table and So they are fitted at different places, and there are lots of gaps in the periodic table. And it turned out that all these gaps could really be filled. There, people discovered elements which had the right atomic weight and had the right uh, chemical properties to fit into the table. Long after, <coughs> Mendeleev. <coughs> well, enduring scientific studies. Uh, have two qualities one of course is their ability to predict uh, phenomena or which was unknown till that time that's one thing as we saw that's one thing with great theory predicts and the other thing is it does this uh, over time it becomes easily accessible to people who are not really expert scientists for example if you think of something like uh, archimedes principle when in the time of archimedes it was the cutting edge cutting edge of science but now any high school student is exposed to it in high school studying student studying science is exposed to it so a great theory over time becomes accessible to <coughs> ordinary people that's another characteristic of a great theory which is the, and and i didn't know in, in concepts a concept you can cert- certainly say is uh, the more beautiful if it's more accessible accessibility and and beauty in a concept is is probably synonymous <clears throat> now of course uh, there's a picture of archimedes the famous eureka story which everybody knows that story will certainly people remember even if they forget archimedes principle <clears throat> well one of the earliest uh, technological discoveries was the use of the wheel for movement 
for vehicular movement. <clears throat> Technology of applied science begins where science ends. And the wheel was probably first looked upon simply as a beautiful, the circle was simply looked upon as a beautiful object. <clears throat> and uh, the observant scientist, primitive scientist, probably noticed that uh, the spherical or cylindrical boulder moved down a slope much faster than the boulder of other shapes. <clears throat> But there was the practical man who saw something there, the technologist, if you like, who saw that it could be used for move, movement, that it could be fitted into vehicles to make vehicles move. That is a technological discovery. It is based on the earlier observation of the scientists who saw that cylindrical or spherical boulders move down slopes faster than other kinds of boulders. <clears throat> So, but uh, the reason the man looked at those uh, of, uh, boulders of that shape is probably because they are beautiful. The sun and the moon are evidently objects which are considered beautiful by everybody, and they are circular shape, and the circular shape for <coughs> stuck to the imagination of uh, men. And when they saw the circular shape elsewhere, they, they extrapolated and found that circular shape aids in things moving faster down slopes and then led to the wheel. The wheel is a, certainly a beautiful object <coughs> and uh, the, even the ancient chariots which are constructed with wheels of, with spokes and so on are obviously beautiful. <coughs> so the beautiful was transported from natural objects like the sun and the moon to technological discoveries like the wheel. <clears throat> I mean, even today, technology does pay attention to beauty. The earliest automobiles the, were, of course, objects of uh, great use, but as, uh, we, as time went, as time, went, as time passed, the technologists made, this, made the automobile more and more beautiful, apart from being more and more efficient. And you see, so the technologist also has always an eye for the beautiful, even as he works hard to make useful objects for uh, everyday use. <clears throat> so beauty is also part of the technologist's search. Well, technology has an ugly side, if you like, even science. Science or uh, technology has an ugly side. There's no denying that. Uh, technology, the ugly side is already revealed in the, during the Industrial Revolution, when uh, <coughs> well, even, even, even while it made things more pleasant for many people, the worker the, in the, on the shop floor was subjected to <coughs> difficult lifestyle, did not enjoy a good lifestyle. In fact, uh, <coughs> one can only Well, as I said, uh, the shop floor is not exactly a pleasant place for the worker. In any case, uh, so, and of course, uh, we have seen the devastating effect of technology in the nuclear weapon. The destruction of Hiroshima is certainly a <clears throat> ugly episode in the history of uh, mankind. And there's no denying it's ugly, but nevertheless, one cannot help saying that uh, the spectacle of a nuclear explosion itself has beauty in it. There's no question about that. In fact, uh, ah, there it is. Uh, 
that is the photograph of the first nuclear explosion conducted by the US Army on July 16, 1945. On the right is Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the nuclear weapon, if you like. And uh, he, looking at that uh, explosion, described it as uh, being brighter than a thousand suns. So there is beauty in there, which you cannot deny, but it's ugly. And even, uh, you know, natural disasters like floods and so on, if they can be seen in photographs, when, when they're seen in photographs, do look well, very impressive at a, in a somewhat uh, less spectacular direction. Look at the tiger. It's certainly a ferocious animal. On the other hand, it is, the, this picture is beautiful. And as the poet William Blake, this, this is what the poet William Blake had to say about the tiger. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame the fearful symmetry? Symmetry is often an expression of uh, the beautiful, <laughs> and uh, he calls it fearful symmetry. Anyway, so there is uh, beauty even in uh, terrible things. Well, here is a quote from, <clears throat> well, scientists will often say that their, their job is a pursuit of truth. It's a job, good job, job description for scientists. And uh, at the same time, as I said, there is also a search for beauty. Search for truth and search for beauty, in my view, go hand in hand. And look at what, uh, this is what Bertrand Russell, one of the leading uh, public intellectuals of the last century, had to say. Science aim is to approach the truth by successive approximation without claiming that any, at any stage, final and complete accuracy has been achieved. So science is a search for truth. On the other hand, I've been saying that science is very much uh, motivated by a search for beauty. <clears throat> well, for the mathematician, truth and beauty are not, uh, need not be antithesis of each other. It can, it does look like they can be opposites of each other because uh, there are ugly truths like uh, the happenings in the world war and so on. And they are not, uh, but for the mathematician, the truth, there is no really contradiction between truth and beauty. Simply because what the mathematician does is to assume a certain number of things as true and then follow it up by using deductive reasoning to arrive at more truths. So these truths are true only if the initial assumptions are true. The moment the initial assumptions break down in the sense if they lead to contradictory statements, then the axioms are dropped. They're no longer considered truths. So from the point of view of the mathematician, there is no real, even if it's uh, the truth and beauty need not be contradictory. <clears throat> need not be contradictory because truth has a meaning only in the context of some basic assumptions. But for the natural scientist, truth and beauty they are not identical. In fact, what happens is what the natural scientists try to do is to <clears throat> explain nature on the basis of some theory which he builds. That's what the natural, natural scientist wants to do. And if uh, he builds a theory which tries to explain nature and found, finds that it goes contrary to some of the happenings in the nature, in nature, has to drop it. So there seems to be a conflict between truth, truth and beauty. Let me quote here a famous uh, physicist, also a mathematician, equally famous mathematician. Let me quote him here. My work has always tried to unite the true with the beautiful. And when I had to choose one or the other, I usually chose the beautiful. He says, well, maybe he's more mathematician than scientist. But uh, anyway, this is what uh, Hermann Weil had to say. He's a great uh, physicist as well as a mathematician. Now, this is said in the context of something, uh, some theory which he developed to explain gravitation. He developed what, he called, what is now called gauge theory to explain gravitation. 
but there is a very faint miscellability to explain gravitation. But something else happened. Some 50 years later, the same gauge theory which failed to explain gravitation stood at the foundation of what is known as quantum chromodynamics. So, some something which is beautiful, which failed to explain this, well, one truth seemed to be able to explain some other truth. <clears throat> now, this uh, kind of phenomenon has been called by the Nobel laureate Eugene Paul Wigner, physicist, who wrote a, who, who gave a talk entitled The <clears throat> Unreasonable Use and the Unreasonable Effectiveness of uh, Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. <clears throat> what he meant was something like this. See, there is some theory which is developed in mathematics, and that seems to come in handy when you, for science, even though the original motivational scientists had nothing to do with the phenomena studied by the scientist. The, the one famous example of that is uh, Riemann's, what, what is known as Riemannian geometry. Riemann discovered his uh, geometry as, it's, as it came to be called later, for it, not for any reasons to explain any natural phenomenon. All that he was trying to do was to expand the scope of geometry to include many other objects then were considered at that time as objects for geometric study. In that attempt, he discovered, he, he developed something called Riemannian geometry, which came in handy to explain some physical phenomena, namely that the Riemannian geometry stands at the foundation of relativity. Einstein's relativity is very much dependent on Riemannian geometry. But Riemannian geometry was not developed with an eye on physics with an eye on explaining motion and relativity in general. In any case, that was, uh, the, it was, as I said, Riemann was motivated by a search for the beautiful. He was not motivated by anything else. And the search for the beautiful in mathematics ended up in, in Einstein something, in Einstein finding something beautiful in physics. <clears throat> well, the unreasonable effectiveness is what, uh, Eugene Paul Wigner called it, but is it unreasonable? Here is what uh, the great Lele had to say. Philosophy is written in the great book, whichever is before our eyes, I mean the universe, but we cannot understand it if we do not first learn the language and grasp the symbols in which it is written. The book is written in the math mathematical language. Now, in mathematics, what is the, as I said, the search for truth is not really, uh, poses no real problems as, as, as with the natural scientists. What is the search for truth? You're looking at, at a bunch of axioms and then you want to find new things based on those axioms. And the axioms are simply a bunch of assumptions which, and you want to apply logic to them and develop them. And then, you know, you can find any number of statements you can try to develop from the basic axioms. You can ask any number of questions, but how are these questions framed by the mathematician? What is his motivation from the question? His real motivation is ultimately beauty. He asks questions which he thinks are beautiful, whose answers who he thinks will be beautiful. That, those are the questions he asks and he pursues them. So by and large, the mathematician's motivation is guided by aesthetics. And once, and it, since mathematics seems to be at the foundation of all science, I, you, can, you can also say, ultimately, the motivation science comes from the beautiful, <clears throat> looking for the beautiful. Well, I, <clears throat> I've been talking about, uh, largely about beauty and that the, just the few minutes, the last few minutes I've been talking about truth as well. And here is another quote from the same part Keats. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all you know on earth. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. So says Keats. And uh, if this is the, if this is a true statement, certainly the search for truth is search for beauty. There can be no doubt about that after this. And I, and therefore it's, one is well justified in claiming that the motivation for science is as much the search for the beautiful as it is for the search for the truth. 
Well, thank you. That's all I would like to say. I hope you find the form this uh, not too tedious and not uh, some, I mean, all that I have said is already practically known to you. So it's just that sometimes people like to hear what they know and believe in from others. So I hope it satisfies that particular uh, need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I will uh, uh, like to invite uh, some questions. If there are some questions, I think uh, uh, Professor Raghunathan will oblige us by uh, taking For some sure. questions. Certainly, yeah. certainly. Yeah. So, uh, are there any questions? <clears throat> Can I ask one question, sir? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, I, hi, I'm Rahul. I'm a, I'm a master's student at CMI. Uh, my question to you, Professor Raghunathan, is uh, actually twofold. One is I'm learning uh, master's mathematics. So sometimes, I mean, uh, I understand that all this construction and uh, proofs are very beautiful, but when in the learning phase, Sometimes they don't uh, feel the beauty, but most of the time it is calculation and focused hard work. So what I am asking you is that is the beauty then and there should be revealed, or it can become later? Well, uh, you see the uh, there's something here. I mean, <clears throat> calculations can be tedious, yes, and uh, they may not appear good, but the end product. Is finally beautiful. That uh, that's that's the way you have to view it. You know, the, if you look at the painter painting, maybe it takes a long time. He mixes the paints and so on, and it's it may, it may not be a great thing to watch a painter paint, but the ultimate result is is uh, something which pleases the eye. It's, it's, it's similar. I mean, you know, it, it's one of the things you have, one has to recognize is that uh, the doing science is not always pleasant. You are looking for beautiful things, no doubt, but reaching there may not be that easy. That It may not be that pleasant. But actually what happens is this, but the, it also depends on the person. I mean, you know, what, what you find pleasant is very much a very personal uh, thing to do. When, when you look at uh, sometimes kids, for, for instance, uh, counting is not something which you find uh, all that interesting. As you say, calculations are not pleasant. But little kids, when they're learning to count, they like to rattle off numbers and it seems to give them great pleasure. It's not, uh, so it's, you know, it's, uh, after all, to some extent, uh, what is beautiful is, uh, not to a large extent, what is beautiful is a very personal thing. It's, it's, uh, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it's difficult to, uh, so I, what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is always, I mean, the, very often the search for the truth in science is the same as the search for beauty. The two things are not really different. The search itself may not, may, may be uh, difficult, may not, you may not find it pleasant, but the ultimate goal when it's reached gives you great pleasure. That's all I can say. I don't know if that is a satisfactory answer for you, but that's all I can say. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks. By the way, I must also add here that uh, when somebody is doing science, uh, they don't, you know, doing the calculation is part of the work, but the calculation itself is not science. I mean, for example, there are uh, people who probably think that someone like uh, Shakuntala Devi, who could uh, calculate things in a very quickly, was a mathematician, which she is not. Her job is not that of a mathematician. Anyway. The... <clears throat> okay. I think Professor Ajit Iqbal Singh wants to ask uh, a question. Madam. Thank you. Thank you. I just, you know, uh, commented it's a great talk. 
and uh, truth is beautiful but proof is dutiful and uh, is it true that uh, 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 seeking absolute truth and not saying anything is not right we can uh, say if this then this and then collect such things and then combine them to an absolute truth when the time comes well uh, I, i don't know because uh, see uh, our absolute there is there such a thing as absolute truth i mean because you always have to you are making directions based on the basic number of axioms and who knows the, the one of those one of these days one of those axioms uh, is discovered to be wrong i mean if it's it's not true I mean, what what do you do i mean if you arrive at a contradiction using those axioms then obviously one of the one of those axioms is wrong so it's it's uh, there's no such thing as absolute truth in life i think it's uh, <laughs> if then can be called lemmas and when they are combined into a big result then it can be called a theorem yeah. and lem- lemma is something like lemma take it mother and theorem is like a mother okay <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you madam uh, it Wonderful. seems uh, professor uh, yeah professor ravi kulkarni uh, will try like to ask one question professor kulkarni हेलो प्रोफेसर कुलकर्णी सर आई आई थिंक आई कैन रीड आउट हिज क्वेश्चन टू यू हीज रिटन इन कमेंट सेक्शन सो ही हैज रिटन दैट मोस्ट साइंटिस्ट डू नॉट रिगार्ड मैथमेटिक्स एज साइंस व्हाट इज योर ओपिनियन how we mathematicians should present our subject among scientists i, I don't know i think i, I don't think uh, uh, people scientists reject uh, mathematics as a science by no means in fact uh, after, as as is well known gauss pronounced that uh, mathematics is the queen of sciences and i don't know if anybody has disputed that of course uh, being queen is not uh, such a great thing in most people's minds perhaps but that is uh, <laughs> no nobody disputes uh, that mathematics is the queen of sciences so i don't yes. think there's a feeling that on the other hand it is true that uh, mathematics is a bit aloof in the sense that even look at uh, newton's principia he calls it the title is mathematical principles of natural philosophy so it would appear that uh, mathematics is a bit aloof like the queen if you like so but it's not uh, i don't think anybody disputes that mathematics is a science though there are scientists who probably don't like mathematics that's a different story anyone else so if there are no other questions i will like to propose uh, a vote of thanks so at the outset i will like to thank professor ragunathan to have kindly agreed uh, and delivered uh, this talk on science day today um uh, thanks are also due to professor satyadev professor ramji lal professor khare professor himadri mukherjee professor rp shukla and other colleagues of the trust who continuously guided me and uh, their, their guidance has been valuable in organizing this event there are friends like uh, dr lakshmi kant dr swapnil shrivastav and others who took keen interest uh, in planning and organizing these events they have been very instrumental in making this event happen now with a note that uh, there is another talk by professor ragunathan on 4th march i would like to thank each and every one of you for participating and making this event uh, happen today i may i now request dr lakshmi kant to conclude the today's event and call the meeting off for today thank you sir ha <laughs> 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 <laughs>
now you may log out log off now everyone log off correct